the new album, The Reckoning Dawn, is finally almost here. It's uh, two weeks on Friday. Tell me about it. It's been so yeah. long since we finished it. Really? It was done in like November. So, I mean, it's not as long as we've waited for some albums, but it's one of those things where you just want everyone to be able to hear it, but you know that things have got to go through their natural press cycle and they've got to go to reviewers and, you know, it needs the build up and the videos have got to come out and all that sort of stuff. But when you're sat on it and like, you know, I'm sat at home right now Hmm. and I've got like, you know, copies here (laughs) and like, you know, like I've got like the vinyl version like here and stuff. And it's just like, I just want people to be able to hear it. You know, I've got the copies of it and I kind of want to send it to people. And it's just like, Hmm. It's just one of those things, you know, you just like, just come out, you know. <laughs> God, that must have been bloody torture. Oh, always, man. I mean, it was worse on our last album, actually. We did, um, did an album called The Hallowing of Adam about mm. two years ago. Pretty much two years ago, actually, just over. And we finished recording that in like 2017 or something. Mm-hmm. It was like a year before it came out when we finished it. But it's just one of those things, you know, like labels and schedules and like getting someone to mastering it and, you know, yeah. when it can be pressed. And it, obviously, like, labels have got other bands, not just yours, on their label. So all the stuff's got to kind of come out. It's got to go in a queue and stuff. And so we're just, like, sat on it forever. Like, all of our friends had heard it, like, for a year and stuff. <laughs> and like, it's like, you know what I mean? It's one of them. Yeah. I mean, though, it's, it's, it does seem that um, bands in general... Um, heavy metal public if you like that have heard it are very impressed there seems to be well worth the wait i mean it's only two years since the last album but four years since the um the more harsh kind of black metal style if you like so i yeah. think a lot of people are really happy about it and it's, yeah i think so it's strange because obviously as maybe you know we did an acoustic album last and mm-hmm. um you know, that was our sixth album. So I, I think for me, it was really important to do that because it was um, a real like, artistic triumph and we wanted to do something that was a bit different and we wanted to, to to prove that, I guess, we had the chops in that kind of arena, you know, that we could do a folk album and it'd be credible and it'd be atmospheric and it have that kind of evocative, goosebump generating atmosphere like some of the other albums have, but it'd yeah. be from acoustic instruments. And I think that, you know, the press wasn't amazing on the last album. You know, the, the people who did it didn't get it right yeah. and didn't quite know how to aim it at the right press and stuff. And I think that, that most of the fans kind of got it. I'd say two-thirds of people probably were really interested in it. But obviously it kind of alienated a few people because some people are just like, no, metal only or whatever. And, like you know, that's how they are. And, and, and yeah. fair enough, you know, if that's what you like, that's what you like. But um, for me, it... it it was something that we needed to do and, and, um, and not everyone kind of reacted well to that. So I'm hoping that it, um, I don't know, it, it was, it was a good kind of artistic stepping stone for us. And I think that, you know, it's something that we need to kind of to focus on in some way in the future, I think, but I'm glad, I think everyone's kind of glad we went back to a metal album. Yeah. Um, like you said, it's this, it's an important um, act of artistry to do that acoustic album. And if you, when you listen to Winterfell, if you can hear the, um, the, the melodic undertones and that kind of thing, you can hear how it would work on more acoustic influences. And especially um, given your influences and inspirations and that, it just seems natural for Winterfell to do that. It doesn't, it's like, it would, for example, if Immortal did an acoustic album, that would seem out of place. But it, it just seemed natural for Winterfell. I think so. And, and I think that's because, you know, we've always had that kind of folk influence. We've always had that, I suppose, desire to talk about history and to incorporate ideas of that ancient music into our music. And it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're somehow, like, learned scholars of, you know, 400 bc or something but you know it, it's it, it it's just the idea that that some of the some of these areas of music have been really important to i guess the development of our nation and and of folk music and, and of the things that are kind of inherent to 
to these islands. And, um, and, and so we always wanted to kind of give that a bit of credence. And I guess that's why we ended up doing the album and, and it having such a focus on, you know, folklore particularly. Mm. Um, folklore is normally um, a big inspiration in winter filler generally, as is poetry and uh, the likes of that. Um, what specific um, poetry and history did you draw upon for The Reckoning Dawn? If any. Yeah, some. Um, so The Reckoning Dawn is, um, is, is an interesting one. The last album was almost 100% based on uh, old folklore and poetry. So, uh, so that, I suppose the acoustic album was way more direct and there was less kind of like political sentiments in that. There was less kind of read between the lines sort of social, uh, I don't know, narrative in it. And it was very much just like, these are some of the interesting old stories from, from history and from um, some areas that we thought were were interesting and some areas that we thought were poignant about pastoral poetry, for example, or um, or about riddles or about long verse old poetry. And so we include a lot of that in that album. Whereas this album, it's got some of that in it, but also it draws, I guess, a little bit more on the um, on the sort of social and political narrative again a little bit. And I, okay. I, I suppose I don't mean political in like a partisan sense. No. It's not like this is like a Labour album or this is like a Conservative album or something. It's more of a like critique of of the way things are and a bit of a a bit of a window from our perspective on um, on I guess on our view of the world and on some of the challenges that we're facing as a society or as a uh, as a people and and how we're supposed to overcome that together and the division that we see in our society and the. I don't know, I suppose the um, the craziness that we see in our society, you know, you live in the society as well, and it, it you, you must feel that to some extent, the, the division and the kind of, I don't know, the, the, the almost abstract nature of of politics and social discourse at this point in time. Yeah. And, and while obviously Winterfell have taken loads of flack for being like an extreme right-wing band or, or whatever we've had over the years, I... I I understand where people are coming from with that, but I just don't believe it to be true. Um, no. and, and I think that we're way more um, measured and considered than that. And actually, I don't think we're coming at it from like a left or a right wing point of view. I think we're trying to almost come at it from above all that and yeah. um, to sort of see it for what it is rather than some kind of like party political point scoring game about politics, which is, which is I feel like what, what happens a lot in the world. It's like, right, yeah. well, well I'm lefty, therefore I stand behind everything this party has to say. Oh, I'm right wing, and I stand behind everything this party has to say. And I just think that's a really kind of poor way of being. Yeah. Because both sides, all sides, tend to have a a really sheltered view in some senses. Yeah. And, that, and actually, I think if you're going to have a rounder view of the world and talk about the world in a in a meaningful way, you have to appreciate that all sides have some valid points to make, and that partisan politics amongst other things, is one of the reasons why we are where we are in the world, because of this almost dogmatic, I don't know, like, tunnel vision approach to to life. Like, if I'm left, I must think like this. If I'm right, I must think like this. If I'm centrist, I must think like this. And actually, if you're a, a considered person, I feel like you can um, you can stand above it almost and see a bit more of a better way through it. Mm. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. I mean, even when you, you look at history and you look at left and right wing um, factions or parties, whatever, there'll be people within those that have different views and there'll be mm. skirmishes within inside. You even look at Labour the last few years. Oh, well, yeah. It's total division. Um, it is, unbelievably so. And so, yeah. but then, you know, if you were to kind of go into it in any detail, they seem to be, you know, not Labour necessarily, but but the, that that end of the spectrum seems to be the people who are really kind of forceful in the narrative, forceful in the kind of discourse, who are really pushing agendas and, and are unwilling for people to be able to kind of express themselves or speak in in public discourse and want to kind of shut people down. And then you've got the other end of it, which is this kind of like super kind of conservative, unwavering, 
side of it. And I, I just think that it, it it's obvious that we have a division between those two things. And I think, which maybe we'll come on to later, is the idea of the Reckoning Dawn, is the, that there is this underlying tension and division between these dueling factions that that needs resolution and i think there needs to be some kind of reckoning of the mind or physically that that kind of leads to a, a new way through it because i don't feel like at the moment and particularly with this pandemic going on that either side would have led it very well no and that really we we're sort of bound by one party who were lobbied by one set of interests and another party who were massively lobbied by another set of interests who seemed to serve those interests on either side before they would serve the people whose lives are kind of hung in the balance. Yeah. And so, um, and so it's an interesting window into that world, I think. And, and I guess we try to reflect some of that idea of shifting political discourse and of, I guess, division and dis distaste maybe in 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 the songs that we wrote so um that's where we find ourselves anyway so i hope yeah. that makes sense absolutely yeah i mean especially you know in britain we the last four years we've been very divided thanks to brexit no matter which way you look at it if you're for or against it is people that will staunchly defend their side of it and they just don't want to hear the other side very much like you were saying it's and people like to surround themselves in an echo chamber where they're hearing their own opinions all mm. the time. So nobody learns anything, as you say. Oh, no, I, I, I agree. And, and I think Brexit's kind of... I mean, so on. I mean, it's funny how that's all died a death now that we're all going to die of a bloody virus. But, like, it, it, that was a really kind of annoying one for me because it dragged on for so many years. And actually, I think, after all of it kind of um, bottomed out, I'm not convinced that anybody got anything that they wanted out of that. It was some really kind of shitty in the middle half arsed attempt at it from all sides. And um, although we almost had a kind of 50 50 split on it in terms of for and against, it did feel like nobody had anybody's best interests at heart as, a, as part of that process. And for yeah. myself, like, uh, you know, I, I felt quite kind of like, put upon by the whole process you know even though you vote one way or the other it, it sort of feels like you personally have made this decision and that's the way the kind of narrative was going yeah. to almost guilt people into like having a point of view and i think that's really bad because brexit aside like i was saying we we you know we find in in in, in many areas of of life and in and in, in terms of like you know people being in bands or whatever it's always like oh well that band have this opinion we think or that band have this opinion we think therefore we're not allowed to like this band or we're not allowed to like that band right. and actually i i wonder whether people have ever thought that it's okay to still be friends or to, to associate with people who maybe you don't always agree with and mm -hmm. maybe it's good sometimes to have a counterpoint to your quite dogmatic view of the world because you haven't always thought about or thought around all of the issues that you deal with in a measured way because you surround yourself with people who think like you. Mm -hmm. And 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 what could be more kind of catastrophic than, like you say, sitting in an echo chamber and not really understanding the perspective of other people that you share the world with? I think it's a really kind of dismal state to be in where we where we live in that world. And and so I guess. From my point of view, I want um, our band and and people who maybe listen to it to to not have to make any like fundamental differences to the way they view the world, but to at least challenge their opinions in some way, mm -hmm. and at least kind of have a rounded view. Because if you don't, I don't understand where we are. If that's the case, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people form their opinions based on their own experiences and from what they've been told, and if they're not being told anything different, or they don't get to experience something out of their comfort zone, then they're not going to have the idea that their view is at fault, because they just haven't experienced, you know, 
I mean, but, don't get me wrong. I don't want to tell everyone that their view is wrong. Like, I have some kind of, like, you know, hierarchy on what's what's the right opinion. But I think if you don't have your opinion challenged to some extent, yeah. then then you never really understand the limitations of your understanding of a topic. Mm. And and so I think that maybe is where we've kind of taken flack in the past, that people haven't understood that um, that side of us where we would like to challenge people or like people to challenge themselves on on their own understanding of, of issues. And, yeah. um, and I think it's all too easy to kind of like put a tweet out, like fucking hell, search our hashtag on, on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. You'll find some some awful stuff. But you know, I wouldn't want to respond to those people. But I also think that you know, you could do better than than the stuff that they're saying. You could be more um, interested in the the whys and wheres of, of situations rather than just the you know, imposing your own view on it. And I think that's, um, that's a really important thing. So I, I, I want that to be a message that people take away from us that I guess it's about challenging people's narrative, I suppose. Mm. Which, like you say, is an important thing to do. A little bit of iconoclasm is good now and then. But um, obviously... I think so. Yeah. But you mentioned the um, pandemic, which obviously everyone's affected by right now. It must be so difficult to finally have this new album available or just about to be, and you can't go on tour to promote it or anything like that. So. <laughs> oh, mate, tell me about it. <laughs> Honestly, it's it's um, it's a really unique situation to put be putting out a new album in, and um, mm. I know every band says this, so please take this with a pinch of salt. But I truly think that this is our is one of our best albums. It's mm. um, it's an album that. I think is a great whole album, mm. you know, like, whereas I think other albums have got amazing songs on them and have got real moments of um, inspiration on them. You know, sometimes there's been like album tracks that we've just kind of worked on and, and that are good songs, but mm. I really feel like this album is, is as, as a whole is really, really great. Mm. So I hope people feel that. Yeah. Because it's, um, it's something that we worked on really hard and I'm hoping that people find that, you know, when they listen to it. Mm. Well, um, what I've heard has been really good. Oh, thank you. So, I mean, it's, it, it means a lot. I mean, yeah. it's really important that, that mm. people hear the songs and, and, and relate to them. You know, that's mm. half the battle with this stuff. You know, lots of times like bands put music out and it's, it's substandard, but you know, they've got a message to put across. And so they, they sort of, speaking that message but the music doesn't quite back it up yeah and i and i want it to be that um that people think that we've got a message and the music's good mm, obviously um you, you mentioned there that the album as a whole is like what the best you've ever done is it's best heard as a complete piece you know like any symphony or painting or something um any work of art basically um would you attribute this um well basically would you attribute the break the acoustic break into being able to focus more on the electric stuff as a complete package or do you think it just kind of came together no i i, I think i think there are learnings there definitely hmm. i suppose you know I've, I've been asked this question a lot so even though you've not heard those interviews i'll try and paraphrase kind of what i said but okay in essence I feel like when we did the acoustic album, we were really trying to capture the atmosphere and emotions of a Winter for the Th album, if you know any of them. But in an acoustic album, so we have these expansive kind of atmospheric songs that sort of have this kind of up and down, moving landscape of, of emotion, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And when you try and distill that into an acoustic album, you have to do it in a different way. And I think, you know, when you're, um, when you're composing for instruments that you don't write, mm. like violin or cello or synth and stuff like that, mm. and you're trying to fit that around quite minimal guitar, like an acoustic guitar or a nylon string guitar, 
as opposed to having this like wall of amplifiers or wall of distortion, yeah. then it can be quite difficult to to find that atmosphere in in different instruments. And so I think you know we had to learn how to do that when we were writing the album. And yeah. I hope and I feel like we did that really well. And then when it came to making this album, I think that we we definitely took some of that into consideration. So the fact that we like kind of learned how instruments fit around each other a little bit better. Obviously we use some of the strings and the violin and cello in this album, which you'll hear when you get to hear the album. Sure. Um, we, we kind of, I suppose we focused a bit more on those kind of goosebumps moments sure. and, and like the, the title track of this album, the reckoning dawn, for example, I feel is like a really kind of like heartfelt, almost kind of like fist pump sort of emotional moment on the album. Mm. And and that's sort of born of the idea that you need to create space for those moments in the song and kind of build that atmosphere and stuff. So I'm hoping that's what comes across from it. And I feel like we learned a lot from trying to create atmosphere from other instruments in that previous album. And, mm. and that somehow <laughs> translates to this album. Yeah. So therefore, would you say it's a more atmospheric album than The Dark Hereafter? I mean, it's, it's, it's an... I don't know. I don't think like we've lost the idea of Winterfell in this album, and I don't think that the Darker After loses that. For example, mm. I would also say that I think Green Cathedral, which is on that record, is probably one of our greatest songs. Mm. And I don't know if you know that song or not, but like, yeah. um, it it just varies, you know, depending on where you are. Like, each album, I guess, is a reflection of who we are as people over those years, and. I think if you're not adding or kind of refining to your sound or developing or learning over the years that you're a band, then then that's I think that's when you find yourself in the situation that some bands do, where you're kind of just parroting back your previous album or you're kind of writing unessential music. Mm. And I guess that we're super critical of ourselves and super critical of other bands that we follow. And, you know, like we'll follow the bands over years and be like, right, well, those three albums are the wilderness years. And those are the fucking classic albums. And those are the kind of all right albums and blah, blah, blah. And so I think because we have that view of other artists and we're all such kind of avid fans of new music and, and being into other albums and artists, yeah. we almost have that kind of inward looking lens on ourselves where we're like, is this the wilderness years or is this the kind of like, you know, the golden era or whatever? And I guess, yeah. like, you know, we, with, with, the, with some sense of irony, we kind of like look on ourselves like that and think, actually, is this a really great album or is this just kind of one of those ones that's making it the numbers in the middle? And I, and I hope we've always tried to keep that mentality at heart to, to write good stuff and to, to make sure that we're not just kind of putting out the same derivative eight songs every album that are just like this sounds like Winterfell sort of thing you know yeah exactly I mean even um, ACDC kind of had that for a while ACDC every album has that sound but there's that point in the mid to late 80s where it's just, it's just them repeating themselves and yeah I think so and, and, and I think because lots of artists are obviously doing music as a living mm. and have to put out an album every two years or 18 months or whatever it is Mm. So they can go on a world tour again. And so they've got new material to bring to fans and stuff. Mm. I think you can kind of get caught up in that idea that, um, you know, you're in an album cycle and that this is who you are right now and stuff. As opposed to thinking, is this the best album that we could have made at this point? Mm. Is this the, um, the true reflection of who we are as individuals or our influences or whatever it is? And, mm. And I think a lot of the time, after a few albums, lots and lots of bands who, who rely on music full-time really lose that. So, um, and that's probably fine, why we find ourselves kind of being so critical, because to us, we don't want to lose that, and we don't want to put out a really substandard album that just isn't, mm. isn't worth it. You know, it's... I don't just want it to be, like, content so we can just go and tour again. I want it to to mean something to people and for people to hear it and be like, fuck me, I had goosebumps or wow, there's a new Winterfell album coming out, you know? Mm. I mean, that, I've, I've only seen you the once, which was a grasp of a few years back. I can't remember which year it was. 
But that was what I'd actually had friends from America telling me, oh, you, you're English, you must know winter Philip. I'm like, no, I don't. Go see him as soon as you can. And that was one where I, I got goosebumps watching, just like, fucking hell, I feel this. You know what I mean? There's something important going on here. There's something special here. So, Thank you. I mean, no, it, it, it means a lot to hear that because we're just normal guys, you know. Like, we, you know, you know, we put our trousers on one leg at a time, like everybody else. But it, it matters to us to 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 try and make something that means something to everybody else. And yeah, and everybody's got their parts playing this journalists and everybody else. And and it just happens that that we make some music. And and um, yeah. and I'm really glad when people respond to it because I, I don't necessarily think we need that validation, but. But also, it's it's great when people kind of feel what you felt, or that yeah, that they feel the things you're trying to put over, and and, and that really matters. And um, even though you try not to kind of care about what people think about the album, obviously you do because yeah, you really want it to mean something to people beyond the kind of five of us that made the albums, you know? Absolutely. I mean, unless you include Venom, I would put Winter Phillip up there as the best British black metal band. There wow. ever, so. Thank you. I mean, that's that's a huge accolade. Thank you. Huh? Oh. I mean, there's been some great bands from this country, but mm. I, I feel like in my heart of hearts that we've really tried to put British black metal on the map. And for mm. all the kind of controversies and ups and downs that people try and associate with us, which I mm. don't believe, by the way, no. I feel like we've always tried to be good people who've tried to give smaller bands or younger bands a leg up. And like, you know, if I think about our interviews over the years, we always talk about everybody who's coming up. We've, when we've done tours, we've always tried to have one of those bands on our tours mm. and stuff like that. And um, and I'm a big fan of this idea that a rising tide raises all ships. And that you can, you know, that just because one of you's broken through a bit more doesn't mean that you should leave your friends behind. And I think there's been some really great bands that have come out. Some obviously sad casualties of... of circumstance like Wodenstone who I think one of the greatest British black metal bands yeah. obviously there's, there's guys like Fenn who we've been on tour with who are one of the best British black metal bands, A Forest of Stars who are equally one of the best you know but then there's, then, then there's this whole kind of like glut of younger bands like Wolven Crown, like Infernal Sea like Ninkasag, like bloody hell almost like too many to mention like Deadwood Lake like we play with loads of them um, you know Grona um Fearsman, Nine Covens, my other band with some of the guys, you know, there's there's like there's tons and tons and tons and Yeah. And it's just funny how like if you just said to me fifteen years ago British black metal could be a thing, people would have laughed at you because there was nobody. There was Craig LaField who arguably weren't really a British black metal band, even though they were from Britain. Yeah. They're a they're a Scandinavian band who just happened to be from Britain, you know. I mean, and it's like <laughs> <laughs> that's true, though, isn't it? You know. Yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> uh, and so I'm really kind of pleased with like what's happened, you know, in a it, with no ego, like in our wake. And I think that yeah. I'm I'm glad that that British black metal has become something other than a, a figment of everyone's imagination. Mm. I think, um, in a way, British black metal is a lot like British thrash metal. It, it's been overshadowed by scenes from other countries or other black metal people, or Norway and Finland and countries like that, Germany. Um, and much the same way, back in the 80s, bands like Onslaught and Zentrix, about, they were getting overshadowed by the Bay Area and Germany again and the East Coast and all this. So. No, I, I agree. But then I think, you know... If you boil it down, mm. a lot of metal derives from this country. Mm. Metal at all derives from the, you know the British Isles. If you yeah. if you boil it back down to Black Sabbath and stuff like that, but but equally, who were the first people to mention black metal? Venom. Yeah. Who were the you know? Obviously, they the bands that came after that weren't British, but you know who were the kind of pioneers of punk? Sex Pistols, The yeah. Damned, you know, all, all those kind of bands, you know, yeah. Captain Sensible, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff, you know. A lot of what's great about music has derived from our small island nation, and it's, and it's it, you know, I'm really proud of that, and I think that 
it, it's strange. You know, it's it's almost a reflection on 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 life, really. That that we're almost this kind of like scrappy, small island state that actually has a lot to contribute, but people always underestimate us. Yeah. And and when it you know when we boil it down, there's a, a lot of good has come out of here, and for everything from kind of you know Oasis and Blur and indie and all that sort of stuff, right through to yeah. kind of metal and black metal and and everything, you know. Who's the best death metal band? In my opinion, it's Bolt Thrower, or one of the best metal bands. Yeah. Death metal bands. They're from the UK. You know, best oh, new metal band, Black Sabbath. You know, you know, it's just like you can you can think of a lot of it, can't you? And um, yeah. and so I, I it kind of makes me happy that in some small way that we can contribute to that from from black metal. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Chris, I think I've probably taken up too much of your time this evening. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's all right, man. You know, 